uh, my great pleasure to introduce Monica Lamb. Uh, Monica comes to us from Iowa State University, where she's been a professor since 2003. Uh, prior to that, I'm going to go backwards in her on her CV. That's how I remember it. Uh, she did a postdoctoral uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship under Sharon Gloucester at the University of Michigan, Department of Chemical Engineering, and she earned her PhD from an, another excellent institution, North Carolina State University, where I did my undergraduate uh, in 2000 under Carol Hall. And she's going to be talking today about force matching. So please. Okay. Enjoy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to to Jim and Cameron and, and Sergio for the invitation to come um, and be part of this this great workshop. Um, it's my first trip to South America as well and really enjoyed my time here so far. Um, so the first lecture that I'm going to give today is on the fundamentals of force matching, which is a method that we use to derive coarse grain potentials for molecular simulations. Um, the goal, really, for this first lecture is to get you ready for the workshop this afternoon. Um, so things that you want to be looking for throughout the lecture um, in terms of what, what the takeaways are are the following. I mean, one of my main goals is that you're able to give a very short description, um, but you know, explana clear explanation of force matching to just pick a coworker from your home institute that didn't come to this workshop and just tell them, yeah, this is what this is what force matching is about. Um, and then again, to kind of prime you for this afternoon's workshop, just be able to to think about the steps that are required to generate a tabulated force field by force matching. And if you know you don't know what a tabulated force field is. Right now, that's okay. I hope by the end of the lecture, this, this first hour, you will. Okay. Now, I have something for you to think about by the end of the week, too. Um, and by the end of the week, after hearing um, several different lectures on different course grain methods, um, you really are going to be equipped to be able to think about what is the best course grain method for your particular problem of interest. Um, and I'd like you to be able to start thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of using the force matching approach so that you can incorporate that into the overall thought process. So these are some of the things that you want to be um, looking for and, and taking notes on um, in this first lecture. So um, as I understand it, this is the first lecture that you've had on coarse grain methods. So I want to step away from the details of force matching for a few minutes and just talk to you a little bit about why we even spend time on coarse grain models. So if you just look at the broad problem of molecular modeling um, in soft matter and biological systems. Um, you know, there's a big there's a big challenge as you as you've seen um, in this workshop, or if you know from your own experience, um, when we're doing molecular dynamics at the atomic scale, um, there's no shortage of very good all atom potentials, and I list sort of all the names that these potentials get categorized by. They all sort of mean the same thing, but you could talk about all atom force fields, conventional force fields, classical force fields, molecular mechanics-based force fields. There's several, there's several good ones available. Um, during the lecture, I'll tend to just so, sort of refer to those as all atom force fields. Um, they all have some features in common. One is that you're typically looking at one point mass per atom when you're following the motion of a system. Um, sometimes, and I would say you could group united atoms where we're just modeling the heavy atoms and ignoring the hydrogens into this conventional or all atom class of, of modeling tools. Um, a, a convenient system size to run for these simulations is about a million atoms um, on a time scale of about 100 nanoseconds. Now, Convenient, um, you know. So this is in the range where you can use on a, you know, a typical desktop processor to, you know, a GPU or something like that. So we're not talking about very high-end, high-performance computing clusters, but it's, this is something that's accessible to most people in most research groups nowadays. The problem is that in engineering and, and in biosciences, the phenomena that we're interested usually happens at the mesoscale. Now, our hypothesis in solving these problems is that there's molecular level phenomena underneath that's, that's driving what we're seeing at the mesoscale. But nevertheless, 
we're still trying to get these molecular modeling methods to the mesoscale. Um, so when we talk about the mesoscale, that could be a length scale on the order of a micron, um, which roughly corresponds to something on the order of 100 million atoms. And we're talking about time scales in the microsecond to millisecond range. Um, in terms of uh, thinking in, in terms of nanoseconds, which, which is convenient to think of for these all atom simulations, that's about a nanoseconds of time. So we're a little out of the range of what's, what's convenient or what's comfortable for these all atom techniques. Okay. Um, and then just to kind of give you um, an overview of where core screening fits in in a multi-scale modeling framework. Um, here we have sort of the number of atoms you can handle in a system size versus the length scales. Here's where the all atom simulations fit in, and then this is sort of where what we're trying to look at with mesoscale simulations. Okay. So these course models then are developed as a bridge between the all atom MD simulations um, and bridging those methods and the calculations we can do to the mesoscale. Um, so typically um, and this is general to all coarse grain methods, you're going to derive coarse grain potentials where now one point mass contains one and, and quite often one or more um, multiple atoms. So it's collections of atoms. Um, we group these collections of atoms. You have to use some sort of sensible chemistry knowledge um, or physics knowledge in order to decide, well, which atoms do I group with which atoms? And we'll talk about that later this week. Um, but those are all bundled together in a, in a collection of atoms called a coarse grain site. And um, when it comes to solvent, of course, in again, in soft matter and biological systems, solvation effects are very important. Um, in coarse grain models, you'll see solvent handled two ways. One is that solvent itself may be coarse grain, so you may you know, have a coarse grain model for water or um, the, any other uh, solvent species. Or the solvent may have no coarse grain sites, meaning that it's solvent, what we call solvent-free coarse graining. So they're oftentimes, too, they're referred to as explicit solvent coarse grain models or implicit solvent coarse grain models. Um, I've seen a lot more people referring to them as solvent-free coarse graining. Um, classifying coarse grain models, I sort of see this as three broad categories. Um, and you'll hear about two of those this week. One is the phenomenological coarse grain models. These are going to be simple models that are built to capture the essential physics um, in the problem. Um, you'll often hear these also called minimal models. And I know someone from Joan Shea's group is going to discuss these um, on Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so you'll hear a lot about sort of the approach of these phenomenological models. Um, there's another class of models referred to as the indirectly parameterized coarse grain models. These are coarse grain models that usually rely on a pre-selected analytical form for the potential. For example, using the Leonard Jones form, um, functional form for non-bonded interactions. And the parameters in these analytical functions are parameterized by calibrating um, usually against some sort of thermodynamic data. Um, for example, the Martini force field is based on oil-water partitioning coefficients, um, and that's how the parameters for that force field is derived. Okay. Um, and then there's a third category, which are directly parameterized coarse grain models. Um, here we now derive effective coarse grain potentials directly from all atom simulations, multi-atomic simulations, or Monte Carlo simulations that we use as reference simulations. Um, there's iterative Boltzmann inversion, and Professor Fowler is going to talk about that later this week. Um, and then this lecture today is going to be discussing force matching. So you'll hear um, a lot about phenomenological models and direct parameterization for coarse grain models this week. But this just gives you some context for where force matching fits in um, in this multi-scale modeling. Okay. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that a 
three categories of course grading um, are very important um, and all have their advantages and, and their contributions that they make to our, our broader understanding of soft matter and biological systems. Um, so, you know, one of your goals this week is to pay close attention to the different methods um, so that you have a better idea of, of what choice to make when it comes to viewing your own um, soft matter or, or biological system problem. So, what I'm going to do first is we're going to think about um, force matching just very conceptually um, first before we get into the, the equations and the numerical implementation. So, you're going to just use your imagination for a little while here. We're going to think about the molecular system um, in the liquid state. Um, I have a cartoon later that's going to have a surfactant in water. So if you can just imagine maybe some short chain molecules um, moving around with, with some water. Um, and what I want you to do, just with your imagination, is just visualize um, me playing a movie of that simulation. So what would the trajectory look like in an all-atom simulation? As you, and I know you've seen some examples of those this week. So just kind of remember what that looks like and you see things wiggling around. Um, now, what I want you to do is imagine if the movie were out of focus. So you know how sometimes you can look at something and just blur your eyes. Um, you can still see the motion, but you don't see the atomic detail. Okay? Um, and, and what you would see is that motion. But, but what you would see is, um, you know, maybe blobs of things moving around. Um, but, but the collisions that those blobs have and the motion that they have are not governed by the fact, by the actual size and shape of the blob, but it's what's under the blob, right? It's the molecular details. Um, so what force matching tries to do is to figure out how can we model the simple blob or out of focus version of that trajectory, but remain faithful or still have the fidelity of the all atom details that are going on underneath. And so that's that's the basic premise of force matching is we're not just saying, okay, here's some blobs and they might move like this and they have these isotropic interactions. We're really trying to maintain high chemical fidelity to what's going on um, underneath underneath it all. Okay? So what we're going to do is and force matching is a way to do that is we can reduce this all atom trajectory to a trajectory of effective coarse grain sites and then calculate the net force on that coarse grain site due to all other atoms in the system. So let me show you a cartoon of this first. Okay, um, but I'll, I'll try to convince you that all the data is there in the all atom simulation to do that. So here's a cartoon. Um, so here's maybe our just a snapshot from um, an explicit atom or all atom simulation. And then we may decide that this is a sensible grouping scheme. So for example, water would be one site and we'd group the surfactant molecule into say um, five different sites, A, A, B, two C's and a D or something like that um, for the grouping scheme. What we want to do in force matching is we want to um, figure out a way to figure out um, what on average these forces are doing so that we can get the net effect into those coarse grain sites by the, by the effective potentials. And again, all that detail is there. Um, we're reducing basically the complexity of the all atom simulation, but all that detail is there for the taking at any, any given time from any all atom MD simulation. Um, it's not clear, and I haven't told you, how we actually get the effect of pairwise forces. But just know that you could take any simulation and, and reduce it down to a simpler order system. <coughs> okay. And so that's the next step in the force matching is we've reduced um, or, or created a coarse grain trajectory of our original all atom or fine grain simulation um, and how do we convert that. Now, so keep in mind, and, and, and this is um, something that I've, I and my students have had to learn to keep straight, is when we're talking about the coarse grain trajectory, we're talking about um, the coarse, the, just coarse graining overlaying the all atom simulation. We're not talking about the actual pairwise coarse grain forces yet because we haven't gotten to that. But what we want to do is convert that into a coarse grain force field. So, um, 
One way to do this um, is by basically just treating this like an optimization problem. So on the right hand side, this um, force, Fi reference, is are these reference forces that are mapped onto the all axis site. Um, so I guess this is the second bullet point here. So this is the net force on coarse grain site I due to all other coarse grain sites in the this, in this simulation. And again, that's going back to this picture on the right hand side. So this is just calculating the net forces on all those different sites. That's something that you can directly obtain from the all atom simulation. It's, it's there for the taking. Okay, there's no, there's no thought involved. It's just a matter of manipulating the trajectory data set. Um, if we have n of these coarse grain sites, um, what we'd like to be able to do is figure out um, what went into the contributions um, from the other coarse grain sites that went into the forces that that one single coarse grain site I feels. So that's where the pairwise um, interaction forces between the coarse grain sites come in. Now, we don't know what functional form um, this little Fij has. We know reasonably it should be a function of the position vectors, Ri and Rj, um, and all the position vectors of the atoms or the coarse grain sites, sorry, the coarse grain sites in the system, but we don't know what its functional form would be. Um, and so for now, this, these terms, all of these pairwise forces are unknown. Um, P1 through Pm just represents some m unknown parameters that we would put in the function, but we have no idea um, what that function is. Um, so if we have, so, so the idea then is we'd want to solve for those unknown parameters by using least squares optimization. Um, and to do that, we have to think about the choices that we have available for the functional form of these pairwise forces. So, um, does anybody have any ideas about what a possible functional form would be that I could plug in for that Fij? Any thoughts about that? A Leonard Jones functional form? Okay. Any other thoughts? Say again? I'm still not catching what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. We may want to include the electrostatic effects. It depends on the system, but we'd want to have that included in there. So we, we're hearing. So so with Leonard Jones, we've kind of captured Van der Waal interactions. We have the electrostatics. What other functional forms might be reasonable in there? Or what would you want to capture? <laughs> Right. Yeah. If we have, like in the surfactant example, there's definitely bonded interactions between the coarse grain sites. So we also have to have a way to capture those. So, so one reasonable thing to do might be to say, okay, let's put down some predetermined functional forms, make our best guess, you know, based on experience, of what those functional forms would be, and then all the undefined parameters that go along with bond angle bending, um, bond stretching, electrostatics, um, van der Waals become P1 through PM and we optimize it. And in fact, the very first form of force matching did just that. Okay, um, And this was introduced by Erkel, and Adams in 1994. Um, one thing I wanted to say is just for brevity on the slides, I'm just referring to authors and years. At the last slide, um, I'll have a full bibliography for all these papers that you can refer to. Um, so Erkel, and Adams, first introduced this idea of force matching, um, and they did just that. They were very interested in um, elemental materials. Um, and in fact, when they did this for uh, to develop the potential for aluminum, they were highly successful. And in fact, it's still a potential that's in use today. But they basically viewed force matching um, as a way to systematically fit parameters to predetermined classical forms. Um, if you want to extend that to systems that are not elemental, so not just single atoms, um, for example, there's bonds and things, uh, it's not as systematic as you would like, um, and it's very difficult 
to sort of build this up for use in molecular systems. Okay. So um, in 2004 and 2005, uh, Isakoff and Voth um, said, stood back from the problem and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of information there about from the all atom trajectory to the coarse grained trajectory where we the coarse grain mapping on there. Um, and we're sort of throwing that away by assuming a functional form. So why not um, use something like a cubic spline, which basically by introducing spline functions, the only the assumption that's inherent in that is that if you sample small enough meshes, so small enough distances of separation and divide it into a small enough um, grid or mesh system, um, the forces will vary linearly over those small increments. And so then you can build up a function using a cubic spline. Okay. Um, later in, in the both group, um, they've investigated other forms of spline functions, linear splines and delta functions and, 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 and B splines as well. Um, they've all more or less been found to be, to be pretty effective in the, in the code that you are going to run this afternoon you'll be using um, the, the newer implementation by Lou and both, which uses um, B-spline functions um, to fit the data. The advantage of, of this, of what Voth and his coworkers introduced though, is that now we have a very general, systematic, easy to use force matching scheme that's amenable to molecular systems where you have bonded interactions um, and where as you'll see um, in some of the examples I show today and the examples that you work on this afternoon, predicting what a good effective uh, core screen interaction would be is not easy to do. You can't just sit down and say, oh, I know what the core screen force field should look, should look like for the head group of a surfactant or, or water or some other solvent molecule. Um, and so it makes it very easy and, and systematic. So what I wanted to do here is just show you in an, um, uh, a little more detail sort of the thought process behind the splines. So if we, if we know um, sort of what this pairwise function would be, basic, the basic idea is that if we make these mesh points, um, these distances between k minus 1 and k and k plus 1 small enough, um, it's reasonable assume that the force varies linearly between each mesh point. And by building that up um, as a system of, of cubic spline functions, in this case for this example, um, we basically can um, introduce an equation that has a lot of parameters, a lot more than some of these other um, analytical forms that you had mentioned. Um, it has a lot of parameters. Um, but the advantage is that these parameters are, are actually giving a truer representation to the actual functional form of the system rather than forcing it to fit, say, a Leonard-Jones format. Um, so what you have in this system is that the forces um, in principle at all of these mesh points, so evaluating the force at FK or evaluating the second derivative, um, they're going to be second derivative of the force are going to be unknown. And so this is where all the unknown parameters come in to the force matching side um, of the optimization equation. So this, this minimization of the objective function. Okay. So as we talked about, this force matching is going to use reference trajectories um, as input. Um, and so these reference directories trajectories come from all atom molecular dynamic simulations. So we've talked about molecular dynamics in the classical sense. Again, these conventional all atom force fields, things like charm and amber and what have you. Um, but another thing to keep in mind that is often underappreciated is that you can just as easily use this force matching method with input from ab initio molecular dynamics. Um, you, you don't need to have a classical force field to start with. And in fact, 
um, in the work that, that, that we do at Iowa State with our collaborators in chemistry, um, they do a lot of calculations with um, the games um, ab initio package. And so what we're interested in doing is developing a multi-scale modeling links between um, some of the best um, ab initio MD that can be done for the reasonable size systems in terms of a, a computational chemistry. And, and using that to parameterize our force fields. So the force matching as input, you can use classical trajectories or you can use ab initio trajectories. Um, just for the sake of, of time and simplicity, this afternoon you'll be using the classical all atom um, trajectories. The output that you get in this solving the objective function is tabulated forces and remember how we, we fit um, parameters to those cubic splines, okay, remember that we want to actually use these coarse grain as the input to a coarse grain dynamic simulation. And so a very efficient way to do that is to convert those forces um, instead of trying to fit analytical functions through those spline functions, what we do is we just use the raw data. Yes? People use ab and to get um, classical all atom. That is a great question, and I want to repeat that. So the question is, do people use um, ab initio MD to get classical all atom MD? They they do, and then that's the basis for say force field. Um, one thing that's very interesting about the force matching approach is you can also use, and and we'll, this is in the in the slides. I'm not sure if it's coming up next or not, but you can also use ab initio MD to parameterize in all atom tabulated force field as well. So you don't have to, you don't have to, what I'm trying to say is you don't have to use force matching to course in the system. You don't have to make, change the definition so that one point mass equals a collection of atoms. You can change the definition so that you're just basically coarsening out the electronic degrees of freedom, but still remain, um, have a model that has one point mass per atom, but yeah. Um, so with force matching using those reference trajectories, it's going to, its output, the output that you'll get from force matching are tabulated forces. So you're not going, you're not in general going to get um, an analytical functional form out for your potential, but you'll get tabulated forces. Um, and MD codes like LAMPS and GROMAX now, and I think uh, NAMD as well, are going to be able to use as tabulated forces or tabulated um, potentials as input um, to their simulation. So you don't always have to have an analytical function, functional form. Do you expect um, the course matching to be done ad hoc for a specific course training of a specific system, or do you do it once and then kind of apply it to other? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point too. So the question was, um, if you do uh, if you if you do get a, a tabulated force for a coarse grain system, um, can you apply it to other systems, or do you do it once for that system? And the answer is, um, you 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 often have to stick with that system. So if you have an all if you have an all atom simulation run at a certain state point, certain temperature concentration, you have to use that force field. Uh, the coarse grain force field at those same conditions. Um, there are a couple of nice papers from uh, Professor Greg Bo's group who looked specifically at that question. So the general question speaks to the transferability of the coarse grain potentials. So one advantage of the indirectly parameterized force fields like Mar coarse grain force fields like Martini is that they are somewhat transferable um, to different conditions because they're they're more or less have this ad hoc coarse graining. Um, if you're going to go over a wide range of state conditions, what you would have to do is force match for each set of, of conditions. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good thing to note about the force matching. Yeah, any this is it's great to have questions. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Oh, I wanted to ask why is force matching as opposed to Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So why why force matching as um, 
opposed to energy matching. Um, and in fact, I have uh, some collaborators at Oak Ridge National Lab who use a, a REACH, they call it REACH, it's an acronym, and they actually um, do something similar but match to, to the energy. Um, I think the, the one advantage of using force matching is um, just it's, it's meant to go with molecular dynamic simulations and, and so in those simulations the easiest thing to work with is, is what you have at hand is the forces. But of course, if you were trying to do this type of thing from Monte Carlo, you wouldn't have the forces and so then an energy matching scheme makes more sense. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Uh, <coughs> pretty similar to the transferability question that was raised. But I mean, when you try to parameterize the forces you based on a brain, or on experimental data, you are taking already an average behavior of the system over somewhat a, 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 a long similar, a long the real time. So you would have the average properties of the system over the, the time resolution of our experiment. When you do that with a trajectory that was done either with atomistic, uh, classical atomistic trajectory or even have an issue, you were taking like the, for that model, you were taking the average uh, you know, somewhat uh, pretty much uh, shorter uh, time. How mm -hmm. would that be representative for a trajectory, uh, an ab initial trajectory, trajectory that was done in, in a different region of the phase space, which is, is what you expect to see in a long uh, uh, CG way? Uh, yeah, th and that's a very good question, and it's one I think you need to ask every time you develop a coarse grain model for, for a new system. So, um, and that's one of the points I'll make later is that your coarse grain potential can never outperform the, um, the reliability of the all atom potential, whether it be ab initio or classical all atom potential that went into the force match potential. And it can never overcome poor sampling. Um, so you raised a really good point that, um, you know, there's a limit to the amount of sampling of, of uh, configurational space that we can achieve with, say, an ab initio MD simulation. We just can't run those as long as a classical all atom simulation. And so, um, again, there are, um, and it's, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where you, just like when you're learning to equilibrate MD systems, nobody can tell you, run it this long, you know, run all systems this long and you'll be fine. What you have to do instead is, you know, use your statistical analysis tools to, to have, you know, to measure the sampling. Um, you know, for, for proteins, you want to look at the root mean square displacement and then there's a lot of different sophisticated tools that look at um, blocking off different sections of the trajectory and looking for decorrelation times and things. So, so none of the force matching frees you up from that analysis of the equilibration of the system. And, and you're right, when you get the force match potential, it's, it's only averaging over the, over the length or the trajectory and whatever that trajectory happened to sample. So, so you're right, there's a limitation there as well. Uh, one other kind of question. Yes. Uh -huh. Last week we were shown here several enhanced uh, enhanced sensor techniques. In principle, you could do that in a simulation with a coarse grain model. To which extent are people doing that? That uh, would that be uh, helpful to an extent? Or? I oh, I think I think very helpful. So if I understand your question right, you're saying like. Could we apply, say, um, some of these enhanced sampling techniques to simulations that are done with coarse grain models? Yeah, I think I I I, I think that, that that's an excellent direction to go into, and I think some people are looking at what I see mostly. What what people are are really focused on now is um, mostly validating their coarse graining methods. So generating a coarse grain potential validating it against all atom potentials and against experiment. And I think we're just beginning to get, um, you know, some sense of what are the, you know, what, are, what sorts of statistical analysis and what, how do we evaluate these coarse grain models. Again, we'll talk about this um, tomorrow somewhat. 
and, 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 and getting some confidence in some of these coarse grain models to then go on and say, okay, now that I have the coarse grain model, let's see what happens at the meso scale and, let, and let's go for it and let's then use these enhanced sampling techniques. I, I think that's the direction that coarse grain has to go. I don't think we're seeing a lot of that now because a lot of effort is just being on developing, you know, the coarse grain tools, the tools to develop coarse grain potentials themselves. But I think that those are excellent problems to look at. And it, and it fits very nicely with what you learned last week. Yeah. Great. Anything else or should I move on? Okay. All right. So, so we have these tabulated forces. Um, and again, these are going to be um, mapped as effective sites to collection of atoms, either in an ab initio uh, trajectory or a classical trajectory. Um, and then we can also, like I said, if we start, so that would be if we start from the classical MD. Or if we start from ab initio molecular dynamics, and this was a question that was raised, you don't have to have the effective sites be these collection of atoms. You could just map them directly one to one to the atoms in an ab initio trajectory. Um, we've done that some with our um, collaborators at Iowa State in, in, in the chemistry department because they've, they've come up with some very clever ways um, in ab initio calculations to study relatively large systems, so like say a solvated protein uh, with some, with some um, methods called, like uh, one of them is called fragment molecular orbital method. It's not something I'm going to go into today, but it's basically a way to study a larger system. So they're, they're still solving Schrodinger's equation, um, but they have a sort of a, a way to approximate certain areas of the protein protein with <coughs> essentially a mean field approximation. And so what they'd like to do is transfer that into a more um, tractable way to go for longer times with coarse grain simulations or coarse grain or simpler simulations. So rather than coarse graining it, we just like to transfer all that knowledge in a systematic way to a classical potential that's not necessarily um, an analytical potential. Okay, um, and so this latter step where we're just removing electronic degrees of freedom, I mean, you can, everybody can argue about whether that tabulated force is truly coarse grained or not. I would argue it is, that it's just, it's just coarse grained from the sense of the electrons, but it's not coarse grained with respect to the atoms. So it's debatable whether you want to call that a coarse grained model or not, but it's, it's still an application of force. Okay. So just to kind of summarize sort of this field of force matching and where it's gone just before we move on. Um, so we have Urkelesian atoms who basically use force matching as a way to systematically optimize parameters for classical potential. So they had an assumed functional form. Um, it worked well for elemental systems. Um, but they really viewed the force matching as a way to structure an optimization problem for parameter fitting. Um, then we have Izvakov and both and co-workers who generalized this approach and saw that this is a really good idea, but we're going to take away the fact that you have to have a predetermined analytical form to fit to, um, and we're going to introduce ex to introduce it to splines. And by doing so, they have extended that approach to molecular systems. That's really where force matching is today. Um, then um, is because in both another basic innovation in this force matching is the further generalization of the method to coarse graining potentials. So in this first paper in 2004, um, they basically used the Urkelesi and Adams idea but didn't remove any atomic degrees of freedom. They ma force matched atom for atom from ab initio to uh, a numerical or a tabulated force potential atom for atom. Um, and it was in 2005 that they generalized it to develop coarse grain potentials starting from any ab initio or classical all atom trajectory. Um, and at this point, they started calling their approach multi-scale coarse graining, meaning that they're changing scales whenever they reduce the degrees of atomic freedoms, or freedom. And so you'll re hear people a lot of times referring to MSCG force matching. And it's basically force matching for multi-scale coarse graining. And the code we use today is named MSCGFM that you'll use later this afternoon. Okay. 
there have been, since these innovations in 2004 and 2005, many, many applications of force matching. Too many examples for me to show you um, here in this lecture, um, but just in general, you'll see this done for simple solvents, ionic liquids, for lipids, um, for uh, peptides. Um, and even for carbon nanostructures like C60. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of simple solvents just to get an idea of what to look for. And this will kind of help you um, sort of structure your thoughts on, you know, as you're evaluating the coarse grain forces that you derive in the workshop today. Um, so the first example is carbon tetrachloride. So here we have carbon tetrachloride here. Um, this these were done um, by a graduate student in my group, Gaurav Panami, um, a few years ago. And what he did was he started with um, ab initio MD for carbon tetrachloride using something called the effective fragment potential that's developed by um, Mark Gordon and co-workers at Iowa State University. Um, so the black line here is um, represents the all-atom um, radial distribution function. So this is the, the black curve. And the way these curves are set up is we try to get as much information on them as we possible. So this axis on the left-hand side represents the, the, the units for the radial distribution function. And then these are the radial distribution function curves. This, so this is output from the all-atom, uh, what's labeled atomistic ab initio simulation, and as well as the coarse grain simulation. And then for, for reference over here, we have um, the potential and force curves um, that you get directly from force matching. So you get the potential and force curves from force matching, and then you use that as input into a coarse grain simulation and do the simulation. So these were simulations where we force matched carbon dioxide to a single point mass coarse grain site. And if you look at the symmetry in that molecule, that makes a lot of sense. It's spherically symmetric, and so we, we coarse grain it to one site. And as expected, we get a pretty good outcome in terms of reproducing the atomistic. So again, the black curve is what we would sort of consider the answer, and the red curve is the coarse grain force field, what we're trying to match. Um, not really any surprises, surprises there, um, as you would expect. Okay. Um, the second system uh, Gaurav looked at was benzene. Um, now benzene is not, you might not think about coarse graining it to a single site, um, but it was one of the things uh, Gaurav just sort of tried as he wrote his force matching code and was you know, testing it out. He wanted, just wanted to see how it would happen. So again, we have the atomistic um, simulation in black, so this is the RDF that's predicted from, from the simulation from this EFP, Effective Fragment Potential Ab initio MD simulation, and then we have the coarse grain RDF. So now you see the performance, um, not great, um, but not so bad either. Um, and really what we can do is we can go in and look at the all atom trajectory and see that there are certain conformations of benzene. So, you know, benzene would like to stack, um, do the um, uh, parallel stacking. Um, that sort of prevents good sampling of all conformations, uh, possible conformations of benzene. And so you see we have a little trouble um, sort of reproducing um, the shape of the first peak. Um, and then we actually have a little bit too deep of um, an interaction here where we have not as many benzene conformations as the all-atom would be. And then again, we have two sharps. So basically, our, our potential is a little bit too, um, too, too, too defined in terms of it's excluding conformations where the all-atom wouldn't and, and vice versa. Um, and it's basically just you can tie it back to a limitation in, in sampling. Uh, and the fact, by the way, that, and this is something that we'll talk about tomorrow, who's to say that another coarse-grained representation of benzene mapping might not work better? So this is where we take benzene and put a single point mass at the center of mass. Like, what are some other ways you could potentially derive a coarse grain model for benzene to reduce the degrees of freedom, but maybe be a little more faithful to the shape of benzene? Do you have, like, a data dependent? 
like force matching? A what dependent? Like dependent on the angle. <laughs> we could we could have we could introduce some angular dependency, but if you just look at the mapping, like we didn't want to do one site mapping, what what else could we do? Yeah. Right, we could do three sites, that would still make it more tractable. We could do six sites. In fact, we've we've tried them all, three and six. Yeah. Yes. Maybe you can do three sites in the middle and then one above and one below. Yeah, you can. So you can start to think of um, different ways to sort of enforce certain, um, you know, geometry. Um, you know, one thing in benzene is you'd like to be able to kind of capture chair and boat conformations and things too. And so, um, one thing you need to be careful of when you're thinking about these is it's good to brainstorm different possibilities, but then you always have to keep in mind. Well, the point is to reduce complexity, reduce degrees of freedom. So you want to try to. Your goal usually in a course screening exercise is. I want to get away with as few sites as possible, okay, when you're doing that. Okay. Um, and then the third example I'll show you, again, all these curves are kind of following the same scheme, is what happens when we coarse grain water to um, the center of, ma of mass. Um, and, you know, the upshot here is that um, what we see is some difficulty in getting um, the, the second neighbor shell, essentially. Um, and it's not obvious that the center of mass for a single coarse grain site of water is, is the place to put the point. Um, again, we'll talk, this is something to think about for tomorrow, but you could do things at the geometric center, for example. You don't have to do it at the center of mass. Um, and we'll look at those, those coarse grain mapping schemes as well. Yes? Kind of had limited sampling in the LS force field. Um, what are you looking for in a coarse grain simulation that you might see if you have to have sufficient sampling in the all atom in the first place before you can even develop the coarse grain? Sure, that's a that's a great that's a great question to ask. So, especially when we're doing with when we're when we're trying to build coarse grain potentials from ab initio MD, we're always going to be limited by the length of trajectories because it's just not tractable and, and system size. The idea, um, and in some of the systems that we've been studying, the idea has been if we can sample the ab initio MD systems decently and get enough confirmations sampled so that we get a reasonable match in the RDF then we can use those potentials in much larger systems to look at larger scale structural effects. So for as a specific example, um, one of the systems that we spend a lot of time working on in this collaboration is glucose and cellobios and cellotetraose, all components of cellulose, and looking at how um, those how we can do large scale structures. So um, in terms of biomass conversion, we'd like to be able to look at an entire um, microfiber of cellulose from a coarse grain simulation that's very faithful to the underlying atomatic, atomistic details so that we can reverse map all atom details on, like, on the fly and maybe do a chemical reaction or sort of look at an enzymatic hydrolysis step. So while we we want to get away with as short of a reference simulation as we can so that um, you know we get the best coarse grain representation of that all atom and then we can do the coarse grain simulation for much longer times and relax the system and things. But yeah, that, that's a good question and, it, and it, it's worth bearing in mind like what is it that you want to study because it may not be, it, it may not be that force matching is the way to go. In fact, that's an inherent limitation in force matching is you have to have access to good classical or ab initio potentials. Okay. Um, in fact, that's the segue here into the this slide. So I just want to remind everyone that there are certain situations that force matching is not going to overcome or make go away. And one is a poor classical potential, for example. So if the classical potential is not good for the system you're doing, don't expect the force matching to come in and by coarse graining it you've covered it up. You're, you can never outperform your classical potential. Um, and the poor sampling um, 
if you have a great potential but you haven't sampled it well enough and again the standard sampling diagnostic tests apply whether it's a protein or a solvent you know you have to use sort of what's the state of the art and sort of assessing uh, conformational convergence um, and just you know equilibration and things um, force matching can't overcome it's going to be limited by poor by poor sampling okay um, is force matching worth it? It is because it provides a very systematic way um, of looking, of, of capturing the underlying all atom details so you're not limited to certain functional forms. You actually get the functional form out and in some cases that's very, provides a lot of insight to your system by looking at the form that this um, tabulated force has. Um, however, as, as you so rightly pointed out, you have to have a reliable ab initio or classical potential available and you have to have the resources available for generating reference trajectories that are sampled well enough. Okay? Um, and that's not a trivial exercise. Okay? Um, I will say that uh, Lou and Professor Greg both and their co-workers have made outstanding progress towards reducing some of the computational costs um, due to the memory requirements of solving this optimization problem in force matching. Um, so the more complicated the molecular system, the more functions you have and that just grows and grows and grows the matrix. And so this 2010 paper, which again the full citation will be here at the end of the presentation, um, has made outstanding progress towards just the algorithm, the numerical algorithm of solving the force matching problem. Um, but nonetheless, they're not solving the problem of getting the, a good trajectory in the first place. Um, but they have made outstanding progress towards making this applicable to very complex molecular systems. Okay, so why bother with force matching? Um, again, I would say the advantages are you don't have to assume a functional form and so you get out some, extract some essential physics and sometimes in a way that wasn't tractable or available to you in the all atom sense because you know, you spent so much time on the all atom details. Um, and we use it specifically in our group, we identified it early on as a way to really um, integrate in a user-friendly way with a multi-scale modeling en environment. Like I said, um, the cellulose problem um, is just one example in our group of where we'd like to have multi-scale modeling where we go up in scale and then back down in scale to maybe do some actual computational chemistry, you know, bond breaking and forming on equilibrated large scale cellulose structures. And so because of the systematic way that force matching is conducted, it's very amenable um, uh, to getting us where we want to go in, in that area. So I will um, close here with just this bibliography list. So these are the, the full citations to some of the papers. Um, that uh, were mentioned in this um, first lecture. Um, for today, uh, especially, we're going to actually use this paper a little bit to kind of the the um, the first author there, Luan Yu Lu, excuse me. Um, he's the one who was the main um, developer of the force matching code that you're going to use this afternoon. And so um, some of the algorithmic improvements he put in, you actually have in the force matching code today. Um, and so we'll use that. So that's, I will stop there on the fundamentals, but I'd be happy to hear comments or questions from you before we break. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what I was thinking is, so we have an all atom, we input an all atom trajectory and we match the forces and mm -hmm. so we have some sort of, okay, so we have the forces and everything. Yeah. And now, uh, like, we run, we have some, uh, we, we have the particular forces and we run some coarse grain, uh, like, simulations. Yes. And then we get some, we get something out of it, some physics out of it, say. Yes. And then we sort of say that, okay, so now that this particular uh, uh, force matching was not so perfect, so we mm -hmm. sort of try to enhance the sort of forces to mm -hmm. get the essential physics maybe yeah. what you want to see. Okay, as, as measured against your reference, right. I guess. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, in one way we are sort of cheating in the sense that we are putting in the parameters and trying to get what we want to see, but in that in, while doing so, are we sort of 
there could be some other physics involved as well which we don't want to see or which we, which we don't know about. So could that, like, such refinements, can such refinements affect that? So I, if I understand right, I think your question is, are, are we introducing bias if we, so, so, um, and I'm sorry, what's your first name? Apertim. Uh, Apertim is, he's asking, you know, he's thinking um, in a bigger, on a, in a bigger view that for, as force matching as an iterative process. So we go through the force matching procedure, we compare it against the all-atom data. You know, maybe, let's just go back to look at one of these. Um, okay, water, for example. We're not happy with the RDF we obtained. What can we do to make it better? So, um, I would say things we can do to make it better without necessarily biasing, you know, because we, we don't really, the, 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 autom the automation of the force matching routine is going to prevent you from sort of unintentionally biasing the results. But some things we could go in and do are sample for longer in the all atom. And that to me doesn't add a bias. Um, another thing we could do is move the, move the, the course training site. So like what I said was, and is this for the whiteboard? So when you have water, um, you know, you have certain choices. One would be just to pick, um, you know, the center of mass, which is probably going to be pretty close to where the oxygen atom is. Another could be sort of triangulating and doing something like a geometric center, which is a little bit shifted off. Um, and so you could go back and redo the force matching from the geometric center to see if maybe that would give you better results. Um, along the way, now you start thinking about, well, what are the physics in water? And so we've, in, in the, the aqueous glucose solutions that we've coarse grained, we've learned a great deal by just simple things like shifting from center of mass to geometric center about the physics that are going on. Um, in a more complicated system, and just to kind of put the benzene back up there, if we go from one site to three site to six site, we learn a lot about the identity of the different sites. And so all of those things, I, I felt all along as, as my students and I do those, that those aren't really, we're not in any way biasing the fitting. We're just, you know, kind of looking for more details and looking at the problem a different way. So. I, I feel pretty good about force matching in that way, but that's a good concern. Yes? With water, for mm -hmm. example, like in a typical all out of force field, might have six parameters. One for like Van der Waals, mm -hmm. a cube of Van der Waals, two for Coulomb, and then like a Yvonne stretch and an angle bend. Yes. Like, how many would a force matching regime produce? For a single site. For a single site, for, for water. For water. For water, it would produce, if you did water to a single site, you'd get one table, one tabulated force table. So what happens is all of those different action, interactions that are, um, how to say it, sort of hard coded and added in and, um, you know, assembled together to represent the fact, you know, that water has certain angular dependencies in its interactions, um, that it likes a hydrogen bond. If you have a well enough sampled all atom trajectory, all those things come together and get captured by the coarse grain force match potential. And so you get it in one tabulated force. So you don't have to do, um, now for a more complicated system, like think, let's think back to this um, surfactant system where we have a chain of coarse grain beads. There um, now a lot of times what we'll, we like to do is we like to separate non-bonded from bonded interactions. And so in the example you'll do this afternoon with a lipid, you'll have non-bonded tabulated forces, you'll have bonded, uh, you know, consecutive bond tabulated forces, you'll have bond angle tabulated forces. And so it'll, it'll go out by um, up to dihedrals usually. Yeah. Yeah, um, a lot of it depends on how you map, but if, it, if you choose the easy, you know, if it's a simple solvent system and you think like for carbon tetrachloride, a single site would do, you're just going to get one table of tabulated forces. And it, it's supposed to capture it all. It depends on your mesh. So remember, um, what you're doing is essentially, um, for a tabulated force, um, what that would be is, let's just say, like distance and force. And so maybe the closest that these two coarse grain sites approach is 
and let's just use arbitrary units as 0 0.25, 0 0.25 what, I don't know, but um, probably this is probably going to be in nanometers. Um, so 0 0.25, and then it depends on how fine you divide your mesh. So if you divide it in like increments of 0 0.05, then you could go down to, you know, you're having um, distances like this with their corresponding force value. And then maybe your cutoff is at, um, you know, 12 angstroms. So you go all the way up to 1.2 nanometers. So it's, you know, it's, it, the length of the table depends on these divisions. And um, I'm not sure if it's in the force matching code that um, we have from Professor Vos group today, um, but the one that Gorov wrote what he found was that there were certain regions where he wanted a finer mesh than others, so he made it so that the user could, um, you know, choose different mesh divisions depending on where they were in the potential. Great. Other questions? The property of function is the best you are doing or you have to see another property right, of the system that match with the all atoms. Oh, are you saying is the best, can you ask the first part again? I'm not sure I heard. Do you have a value distribution function that match perfectly with the all atoms one? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have the other property. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So the question is, um, you know, all the examples I've shown compare radial distribution functions, um, and are there other ones? And that really depends on what it is you want your coarse grain model to do. Um, in the examples that I've shown, we're basically interested in thermodynamic properties which are related to structure, and so we're trying to match um, good structural properties. Um, on Wednesday, I think it's Wednesday, but in the third lecture I give, I will talk about um, how do you get good transport properties? One thing I can tell you is that coarse grain potentials, like the ones we show here, will probably be pretty lousy at predicting the diffusion coefficient or the viscosity. The coarse grain, we've just taken out several degrees of freedom, the coarse grain beads are moving too fast, and so we're not going to get accurate dynamics. And that's a problem for direct or indirect parameterization of coarse grain. All of those categories of coarse grain models suffer from that. Um, but there are some ways that um, during the force matching process you can actually accommodate the um, degrees of freedom. Um, they're fairly new and there's not a lot out there. Um, but to get back to your question, you know, so if you're interested in thermodynamic properties, the radial distribution function is sort of the, the basic, the most fundamental um, diagnostic that you can run, but certainly any property that you can calculate, um, that you can think of to calculate that you want to make sure is represented well, you, you need to do that to validate your force met, your coarse grained potential.